Hey everyone, this is Al McKay. Welcome to episode 45. I'm interviewing Mark Simonetti, a amazing illustrator and concept artist. Let's dive in. Welcome to the Alan McKay Podcast. Alan is an Emmy Award-winning visual effects artist and mentor to many leading industry experts. Listen in as Alan talks with other industry leaders in film, video games, and visual effects about their experience, lessons, and methodology. Alan will teach you pivotal advice to fast-track your career, better your skills, and reach your ultimate dream job. Check out the latest episodes on alanmckay.com. Hey everyone, this is Alan McKay. Welcome to episode 45. I'm interviewing Mark Simonetti, who is a concept artist as well as illustrator who's worked on massive amounts of really amazing projects. Some of the big clients off the top of my head are Ubisoft, Activision, Electronic Arts, and many others. So obviously a lot of game stuff, but at the same time, a lot of fantasy projects as well, which are really high profile. Obviously, a song of Fire and Ice, which is also known on TV as Game of Thrones. Um, he's got a lot of really iconic work in there. Uh, his published book, Coverama, is really cool. I'm actually looking at it right now. Really amazing stuff. Uh, this guy is awesome, and I managed to hang out with him at It's Art Masterclass in Paris earlier this year, and we're going to be both going back in March, I believe, next year for another event. And this is going to be a lot of fun. This will be a chance if you guys want to come along to interact, meet us, get some beers. And uh, so we'll both be there. But at the same time, we're, we're really planning to do some cool stuff for this event. So if you want to come along, I'll leave a link in the show notes to where you can register for that, as well as links to a lot of Mark's artwork, his website, everything else that you'll ever need. And that is it. So I want to make this really, really short and get in there. One thing I'll mention is I'm running a contest. I'll be announcing what you'll be winning. It's something pretty special next episode. But if you want to partake in this, then simply go to iTunes, uh, go to the podcast. I'll leave a link in the show notes and leave a review if you like the show, either short one liner or, you know, as long as you want. But basically just leave a hashtag VFX1 at the bottom of this and I will be calling someone out end of August as the winner. And this will be a really cool prize. So if you want to check out the show notes, go to www.alanmckay.com slash 45. And I got some really awesome episodes coming up. It's going to be picking up the pace. I'm quite excited. So let's dive in. Hi, everyone. This is Alan McKay. I'm here with Mark Simonetti. He's a concept artist and illustrator from France with a vast background, creating amazing visuals for many high profile clients like Ubisoft, Activision, Electronic Arts, Magic the Gathering and Limitless others, as well as many high profile fantasy novels. And of course, uh, one of them being a song of fire and ice or better known as Game of Thrones on TV. It's a uh, Pretty early, I guess, for both, well, for you, and uh, I guess it's pretty late for me over here, being close to midnight and early morning over there. I'm glad one of us is alcohol in front of us. I won't say which one. <laughs> but um, so I guess just to begin, I mean, if you want to, I've done my kind of formal uh, spiel, but if you want to kind of elaborate a little bit and kind of mention a bit maybe of what I haven't covered or some things that I don't know about you, then uh, that'd be great. Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, well, <laughs> hi. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I'm, I'm uh, winging it, okay? I'm half asleep here. <laughs> <laughs> I just woke up. I'm, I'm in the very same state right now. Uh, uh, it, this is basically what I've, what I've been doing, right? Uh, I would say that I'm a, a reader first and that I got to, to work in my favorite books, which is the big thing to me. Mm -hmm. uh, I've also worked on many video games. Uh, I'm mainly doing some cover arts and some concept arts. So I'm basically working at the, the very the two stages of the, the making of a game, so the very beginning and the very end. Uh, I also work a little bit on movies and uh, long feature films, and also I'm doing some stuff for advertisements. Some, sometimes I'm, I'm doing some matte paintings also for cool for short projects. Yeah, uh, that's mainly that. That's awesome, man. Yeah, yeah and that's cool. 
Yeah, well, I kind of figure um, I might just throw you in the deep end and rather than starting out with the easy questions, I might just jump right in, especially because you just woke up and you, you haven't quite <laughs> gotten to your, your senses yet. But um, I don't know, like if, if uh, you want to, then what's the proudest project to date that you've worked on? So diving right in there, like what's the, the biggest project so far that you've worked on that you're you know, able to stand proud and say that you, you know, this is yours? I don't know which uh, which one to to answer because uh, uh, I, I will I will have two two answers for that one. Uh, first one, uh, the, the the project I'm working on right now is it's the biggest one in terms of uh, I'm working on um, on Luc Besson's next movie, which will be called uh, La Lion, mm -hmm. and it's uh, basically it's um, it's going to be awesome. Uh, it's an adaptation of a, of a comic book, which is quite well known in uh, in France, and uh, which has inspired a lot of uh, of stuff from uh, in, in Star Wars, for example. Great. So the the the, the uh, yeah, what to say it? The, the basic material is very is very rich already, and uh, I've got all of the freedom that I want, and uh, it's very in. Um, in a creative way, very rewarding. Uh, mm -hmm. So well, this one is just uh, awesome. And uh, the other projects are most of all my um, yeah. When I, I did uh, illustrate my favorite books, so I, I won't uh, you know I won't graduate the books because it's just like a movie. You can say uh, you can have your favorites, but you don't. I don't have my. <laughs> so yep. and I, I know <laughs> and I know the the authors. So I, I don't want to. <laughs> problem with them uh, so yeah yep. when I had to illustrate uh, some ice and fire and and later on to make the iron throne and mm -hmm. that was a, a big thing for me that's for sure because I'm a big fan of the books I'm yeah. a big fan of, uh, of George and uh, he's a super nice guy so uh, <laughs> I'm very uh, I have a lot of lot of uh, respect and uh, mm -hmm. admiration for for George or I've also been illustrating uh Robin Hub, uh, HP Lovecraft, mm -hmm. uh, um, yeah, and yeah, so that's very interesting. For, and Terry Pratchett, uh, also, uh, yeah. So those are my big, my, my big thing. Because I, I love the books. When I'm loving the books, I'm just so so happy to to work on on those. Yeah, no, that's really cool. I'm I'm actually kind of curious about that, and um, I might loop back to it. Well, I definitely will loop back to it later on. But I'm just kind of curious: when you are working with those authors, do you have a lot of close collaboration with them um, when you're putting together visuals and you know working on the concepts? Uh, that's pretty rare. In fact, uh, the only one which I, I, who, who I have um, uh, you know um, the direct feedback with it, uh, is George A. R. Martin. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, I just, in fact, I just asked him. So most of the time, the, the publishers and the editors uh, just, yeah. uh, 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 what do you say, it? A protection more, more of that to yeah. to ensure that I, I can work properly. Because sometimes the others, uh, uh, so <laughs> sometimes doesn't care. Uh, sometimes isn't uh, properly um, trained to to do art direction. So yeah. Uh, most of the time, they just ask me what what they need uh, to to sell the books, and I, I work directly with the, the, the publisher, and it's fine. Uh, but for some authors like George, uh, who have a very uh, strong visual um, knowledge and effects, uh, as you can see, for example, in the books or in the, the series and the, the TV show, it's so close in the TV show because he is a very good writer. Who, Mm -hmm. uh, we know this stuff, you know, he knows how to describe things very well. So it was um, important to me to, to ask him if it was okay or not. But uh, yeah, for right. it, it's a lot of stuff. I couldn't because he was died a long time ago. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. And to yeah. approach it, I just had some slight contacts, but I didn't work directly. So it's pretty rare to, to have direct feedback. Of, uh, That's fair. Time. Yeah, I guess it's like video game publishers too, and a lot of other ones. Like you know, they they basically say we need a cover for a game or whatever else. Like go go make something, and it's it's not as much the. Um... Actually, I will say I worked with um, the guys who made Bioshock, and we did a bunch of stuff for them. And the the creator, I forget his name, is Ken something. Um, he he was very kind of like um, tied into everything, so 
he would be calling you up saying like, no, change this and fix this. But, um, you know, most of the time it's, it's, you're right. It's very disconnected. It's kind of, you know, go do the job and they're, you know, busy, I guess, writing the next novel or doing something else. Yeah, exactly. And, yeah. Yeah. but sometimes I have feedbacks later on. So after the, the cover when it's published, I have some, some emails from, from various, various hotels. So it's just great to have, you know, feedbacks. Uh, hopefully the positive feedbacks are great. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I never had negative ones because uh, people are, are polite, I imagine. <laughs> uh, that's so, fair enough. And um, I'm just curious because you're you're working with Luc Besson right now. So uh, can you tell me is he has he decided to make a uh, Leon trilogy and do a two, three, and four? <laughs> <laughs> I can't say anything about it. <laughs> Come on, everyone else no, is doing he's it. He's a nice guy also, and he got a very. He, he knows how to tell a story, so mm-hmm. it's very, very comfortable to work with him. It's very, yeah, very yeah, interesting. He, yeah, he ju- he's just interested in, in creativity. That's the thing. So yeah, yeah. I, when you mentioned that you're um, you're now working with him, that was definitely one of those things that you know was pretty cool. I mean, he's definitely a very visual guy. I mean, if you look at Fifth Element, I think it was was it Mobius that he hired for uh, designing. That Absolutely. Project. In fact, he, he, he hired Mobius and uh, also uh, Mezia, which is the guy who, who made the comic book. Uh, oh, right. I'm working, that I'm working on. So basically, he just uh, he, he hired the, 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 the best uh, comic, uh, mm-hmm. comicer, that's how you say it, comic artist. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And he, he told us some, some stories like uh, not just coming uh, in the middle of the night uh, at the office because he had uh, an idea on the, on the movie. So, mm-hmm. yeah, that's cool. that crazy too. Yeah. Yeah. I remember reading up about that, like, you know, a thousand years ago now, but, you know, <laughs> even, even the, the fashion designers, they'd, you know, he'd bring on and everyone else, like definitely make some really, you know, Oh yeah. It there. was a very, uh, Jean-Paul Gaultier, a uh, very friend. Uh, oh, right. French, uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, that's cool. And um, I don't know, like, I'm, you know, we won't talk too much about it, but like, uh, I don't know, how do you how do you find it working with him at the moment? Is it pretty inspiring getting to, you know, work with a pretty renowned French director? Yeah. Oh, 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 did, I, oh did I add a job? That's that's the, the question. Yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> it, uh, it all come back to five years ago, four years ago, and there was, uh, I've been contacted directly by the, the uh, his, um his assistant mm-hmm. back then, and she just told me something like, "Oh yeah, Luke want to want to see you in two days." So I had to, to catch my my train tickets and do all the stuff, and then then the the, the meeting was cancelled and delayed and <laughs> and delayed mm-hmm. again. So I had to to finally I I'm, I met uh, him and we were several several artists something like. Uh, Mm-hmm. Ten, 10 artists and we, we, we made t- tests for, we, we had something like two weeks. He just told us the movie. Mm-hmm. We had a meeting for one hour. He already knew, five, year, five, five years ago, he, he knew his movie uh, wow. that is right now. And he could tell us and just, uh, he, he already had his it in mind. Mm-hmm. So he just basically told the, the whole movie to us and then he said, okay, we have two weeks and <laughs> uh, we, we, we do whatever you, you want with it. Wow. So that was the test. Uh, so yeah. I had some, yeah, I had the gig and, but uh, then it stops the, the, to, to let him uh, find the, 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 all of the finances. Mm-hmm. Yeah, all yeah. money to, to 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 produce the film and yeah, and back to to the movie. But uh, yeah, that's cool. And what are some of the biggest challenges? I guess, like let's say in this case of um, approaching, doing a test, and figuring out all the visuals with you know not really much to go on. Like, um, what are some of the big big challenges when you approach a project like that in the beginning? Oh, I take it exactly like a, uh, like a cover art for a book, in fact, because uh, all each author has its, its own universe, in so its own tone. Um, so it's just like uh, George and Martin or, mm-hmm. or or Project. They all have their own tone, their own vision. So I just try to to, to synchronize myself in, in a way. For mm-hmm. example, the fifth element is the closest thing that it's gonna be to to this movie. Because uh, that's official, I can say. It's not <laughs> uh, You're so, fired. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and maybe in one hour. Uh, uh, <laughs> so yeah, I just try to to keep the spirit and to 
to, 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 to try to emphasize the story in each design. So that's the, the whole, the whole thing to me. It's not, mm -hmm. yeah. And I try to, to keep things a little bit original. Yeah. That's awesome, but, man. And, um, I'm just kind of curious about like your process. I mean, when you typically start a piece, is there a lot of reference that you gather in the beginning or do you just usually kind of free ball it and just bust out the crayons and be like, all right, I got this. I'm just going to start painting and, you know, I'll figure it out as I go. <laughs> uh, most of the time, uh, I, I'm using several tools uh, right now on, on that project. Most of the time I'm using only Photoshop, but for, for this one, I, I, I want to be fast and sometimes I want, uh, you know, to to have a nice rendering. And so I'm doing some, some 3D too. Oh, cool. Cool. Uh, because uh, it's it's a little bit like you know cheating, so I've I've been uh, educated to to not use three at all, mm -hmm. uh, except for for references or for uh, for nailing the, the very good perspective at the, the correct point. So yeah, uh, I've been used to to just put my all the ideas down uh, without any references, and then bring the the reference uh, once the the overall composition is made. Mm -hmm. And that way, I'm, I'm very personal in my uh, composition and the way I I put uh, the different elements in the in the in the pictures, and uh, I I can correct things later on. And but uh, having references is um, um, I would say it, it's 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 really necessary. It's uh, you have to uh, yeah, or you have to have them in mind. So. Cool. So by references, you mean, um, do, you know, like finding other, you know, uh, pictures or photos, stuff like that online. Do you ever like kind of source stuff, you know, from real life or anything like that? Oh, no, real life. I, I really don't have time to. <laughs> yeah. Re real, real life is boring anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of my friends, um, I'm actually going to be interviewing him for the podcast later this week. Um, Chuck Watskowitz is the, he used to be the head, uh, of the design department for Blur Studio. And yeah. I remember years ago, um, he started to kind of dabble with uh, 3D because uh, he was really enjoying it just to kind of speed up his process. And it's kind of funny because um, I guess Blur wasn't really big on, like they were kind of slapping his wrists a little bit, like, you know, you shouldn't be doing 3D, like get away from there, you're, you're 2D, you stick to 2D. But uh, so, but I remember him like kind of saying that he, he didn't understand that because it, it made everything faster for him because he could easily block out just basic shapes and get the perspective and everything correct right away. And then from there, be able to paint over it and start detailing everything. And uh, it really kind of helped the whole process. So it totally makes sense. It does. It does. Yeah, sure. Uh, it's, a, it's just a tool. So once you have your, the, the 2D view uh, of, of your picture, you can use it 3D. Uh, photo bashing, whatever you want. It's, it's okay. It's just a way of... Uh, uh, there's a little bit of, uh, of philosophy kind of stuff when I'm doing cover art because I want something very personal with it. With it, so I try just try to use. Uh, I prefer the long road to make cover art because mm -hmm. I, I don't want people to say, "Oh, yeah, there's, there's a photo, sh there's a photo there, there's a three D element there." I can see, you know, the uh, yeah. crenellation, something like that. Mm -hmm. it's something the rendering gets something very. Uh, uh, you can identify it very easily. So, right. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want people to. I just want people to see the brushes. If even if they sometimes I want big brush strokes. It, it depends on the the energy I want to give to the piece. But uh, yeah, when it's there's more of kind of a artistic process that I want for the arts and for video games uh, advertisements and uh, mm -hmm. and movies. Uh, I want to, to be fast and to be effective and to have a nice rendering so that the director can, uh, have, in, a, in a glimpse, can have the the final view of uh, of an um, intending. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Well, that's great, man. And I'm just kind of curious, like um, when you first started out, like you you didn't just you didn't initially start out and be you know like today I'm gonna paint and I'm gonna become a concept guy. Like I think your background was engineering or something. I remember we were having a, a beer at the yep. Hard Rock Cafe in Paris and <laughs> talking about this <laughs> of all the places to go. But uh, yeah, so like what was your background before you got into, you know, what you do now? Okay, so first of all, what happens in Paris stays in Paris. <laughs> <laughs> Mainly because I can't remember most of it, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, yeah, and, and yeah, I started as an engineer, and why engineer? Because I just followed the the path, the, the regular path of uh, any student. So okay, you're good in math, uh, do do math. Okay, so mm-hmm. I'll get all along the studies, and just to realize once everything was done that uh, I didn't like that the the job because the uh, the the concept of mathematics. Uh, well, it was interesting. But, uh, so I've been working two years at T4, uh, making frame bands. I was uh, formulating the coatings of the frame bands, uh, which is uh, which was really a pain. Uh, so I, I got depressed, and I just said, "No, I, I don't want to uh, get old uh, with uh, doing and, and having done all, all uh, only only that job. It's mm-hmm. not possible." And uh, as a kid and all my, um, uh, during, oh, I don't know what you said, um, my, my grown up life, uh, I've been studying drawings, but, uh, in after call, uh, lessons mm-hmm. in, uh, Le, Le Beaux Arts. I don't know if uh, that makes sense. Uh, it's just, uh, art school in, for, for children, in fact. So okay. that's the only, uh, artistic background I had back in the time. So I've, I've, Taken those ten hour, ten years of uh, of art schools after you know the, only the, um, the Wednesday lessons just to to give some uh, some freedom to my parents. <laughs> <laughs> so and so I, I I quit my jobs my my job as an engineer which uh, was just awful and um, uh, all the money I, I had uh, that because I was living. Uh, in, at my parents' home back then. Uh, so I, I made a little bit of money. So I put all the money to, to study, to, to pay me one year of, uh, of, uh, of uh, art school, a real one. Uh, and, but I didn't have the level to make only drawings and paintings. So I just say, okay, I'm a little bit like a tech guy. So I'm going to do 3D instead of 2D. Mm-hmm. That, that and, damn 3D uh, stuff. So, yeah. <laughs> so I only, in fact, learned, uh, the um, drawings, but in, in the side way, you know, uh, because mainly I was just learning in 3ds Max mm-hmm. and uh, on a small PC with no uh, tablet at all, and something like, like two. Oh, it was uh, 256 uh, uh, megabit of RAMs. Right, of, right, right. <laughs> yeah, so you, you couldn't render anything with that, and <laughs> so you, you couldn't even launch Max that well. So uh, I've learned that, that 3D, and then but I, I still wanted to to paint and to create stuff. So uh, then I, I went, uh, I applied in many video games company, and finally got um, an internship for two months in one. And still, I wasn't creating anything in 3D. Or it. I was just, uh, you know, um, putting cameras in video games for, you know, scripted cameras. Right. And I was working as hard as I could. So they, they just get me and I finally get a job as a 3D background modeler in for PS2 back in the days. Wow. Uh, that was fun. And I, I was just next to many uh, great, great, uh, very, very good artists, in fact. Uh, it was in Lyon in France and uh, it was at white screen game. We were doing back in the days a, a game that was uh, killed later on, but it was so cool to make. It was a Capcom game. Oh, yeah. Uh, so I, I made a lot of, uh, in fact, backgrounds for that Capcom game. It was a zombie, a medieval zombie game. So <laughs> really, really awesome. nice. Yeah, and um, the, the 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 game was killed. And uh, when I had that job, I was training myself every night in in two D. In fact, making illustration and speed paintings and mm-hmm. and coloring. Mm-hmm. And I've been doing that for two years. So basically, I was sleeping something like three hours every night. I was training myself the weekends. And when I get not good enough, but uh, because. Uh, this, there was always a huge gap between me. Uh, we, we were just one year of, uh, of art, stu- uh, art studying, in fact, and all the guys that we, that have made their, um, yeah, the, the whole art, art courses, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You just can say if I'm just uh, <laughs> if my, my my French and English mixing together or make sense or not. No, no, no. You're you're doing totally fine. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> um, sure. But that's cool. I mean, I, I'd love to talk a bit more about that because, you know, switching, like how old were you when you switched from engineering to, you know, going yeah. to art school? 
Yeah, I was 25 back in the day, so I, okay. I, I didn't know if, if I was uh, already too old or not to, to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and but, uh, sorry, yeah. go ahead. No, but the, the, the more you, the more I would have wait, and the more it would have been difficult. So, mm. and then you just have to, to jump from the cliff and see what what happens. <laughs> and um, what was it like? I mean, was it pretty scary, kind of um, switching careers and not knowing, you know, whether you'll succeed or, or what will happen? Yeah, uh, it, it was very exciting, more than frightening, in fact, because I, I just, I really hated, in fact, uh, the. Um, uh, the engineer career really mm -hmm. hated it. <laughs> just yeah. know. So I was so so relieved, and uh, I was that 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 for really can always do something. Uh, yeah. To yeah. work hard, you just have to. Uh, so no, basically, I didn't have the choice. I had to do it. So it's that's, that's cool. And yeah, yeah. I, I like that though. I like the fact that um, you know, I think it, it's pretty important that like when you when you want something, you got to work hard for it. It's not just enough to want it you've got to you know spend those weekends those nights and work crazy hours but put it all in to be the best you can be because you know it's all about making that change now and that way later everything's going to be okay but like you know at that time of of uh starting out of of transition you need to be the best you can be yeah. and you need to really apply yourself to learn and push yourself um otherwise well, so, so, you won't yeah, really make so, it yeah so, sorry no, no, you will be, uh, you, you yeah. asshole. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Before, uh, being, before being the best professional, you have to to be the best student. Yeah, and the, 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 yeah, the, the, that's just wanted to add that little shitty. Thing, so. <laughs> hey, I like it, man. I like it. And um, I was just curious. I mean, I'd love to talk a bit about your your techniques and and how you work and like. Um, one thing, obviously, you've got a lot of experience doing is speed painting, and you've even just mentioned it before. I know that for Wacom and Adobe, you'll go on stage and um, you know do uh, big speed paintings in front of you know large crowds of people. Uh, I'm just kind of curious: Have you ever had like days where you just blatantly fuck it up and don't manage to get anything good out or <laughs> get put on the spot? Yeah, so many days, in fact. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's that's the, the whole point of the speed paintings. You, uh, you never do a good speed. Uh, it's always, always shitty. Whatever you will, you will do, it's always a small thing uh, that shouldn't be show, shown on internet or anything. It's just a training thing. And uh, that's fun because the first time I've been doing uh, uh, speed paintings in front of many people, I was not trained at all. It was uh, in Portugal, uh, yeah. you know, a, a Trojan also. Oh, right, right. Yeah. So it was just, um, I, I, I have, I just wanted to, to show my techniques, uh, my basic techniques, but that, that works on, that work uh, with, uh, you know, a long, a long, uh, long term illustration. So something like one or two days of work. And I just wanted to show it more, in a, in, a, in a more fun way. So I just, uh, they say, oh, okay, let's, let's do speed pen just to show. And the, the, the picture was just awful. It was just. <laughs> you're, yeah. you're like, trust me, I'm, I'm better than this. Just give me a second chance. <laughs> uh, no, but, eh, that's okay. Uh, that's how you learn <laughs> by feeling. That's, that's the, so I, I trained myself in order to, to make better impressions. So even if the, 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 the illustrations are bad, are mm -hmm. awful, uh, yet that, uh, that layer of, of, let's say it, of either, either the, either shit. I don't know how to say it. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So it's just basically you, you put sparkles in front of the eyes just to hide everything that's beyond. Hey, yeah. I've, I've seen you, uh, doing a speed painting. It's pretty impressive. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm kind of curious, like, uh, for you, do you find like doing the exercise of, you know, for, forget the crowd and, you know, showing, like demonstrating, but like for your own personal use, do you do a lot of, that in your spare time and like do you find it to be really beneficial for you to get better and to really hone your skills yeah when i don't when i don't have work uh, I, I train myself that's the uh, that's the thing so speed painting is very very useful to 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 try new stuff and to know what you're not good at so uh, basic, uh, I'm using speed painting even if I work uh, just to, to show many, many different illustrations for a director or for cover art. I, in, fact, in fact, just my rough sketch are, are just speed paintings. That's, uh, mm -hmm. 
So uh, yeah, to, I'm I'm training myself uh, when I'm uh, when I'm um, so when I'm working on a project. Uh, I'm using speed paintings for for the painting part, in fact, because I don't care about the time uh, that I'm doing. But uh, if it remains between uh, uh, thirty minutes and one hour, it's okay. And when I'm training myself, I just keep only the time in in mind. Mm-hmm. That's where mm-hmm. I'm doing sweet painting between 15 minutes and 30 minutes. And that then I, I have all the creative juice and I, I know where I'm losing time, you know? Right. Uh, so I've learned to, to, to put the, the right, uh, the right color, uh, first, or at least the, the most effective color first and not to, to, to lose myself in illustration because it's very easy to do. Yeah. I, I've been listening to one of your previous podcasts. Uh, when you say you're, you're doing meditation in the morning. Oh, uh, uh, meditation, did you say? Yeah, meditation. Yeah. Uh, yeah. As your, your morning routine. That's yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll, sometimes I do meditation also, but there's something like meditation in illustrating. You can lose yourself right. in, a, uh, in a painting and uh, that shouldn't happen. You, you got to stay focused. And That's a really good point. Because, um, I, yeah, I mean, it's... You know, in in one way, I can see it being, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the word therapeutic, you know, like it can be very good and calming to paint and get lost in the moment. But at the same time, like, you know, you, you know, it's kind of counterintuitive. You want to keep focused. And that's one thing that I do a lot is like I have a, a timer that goes off every hour or every 30 minutes just to kind of remind me to get back on track because it's so easy to kind of get lost in your work. And then you got to be like, wait a minute, are you just, you know, clicking the button or you're actually like trying to achieve a result and move forward, you know? So, so yeah. yeah, that's good. I like There's that. a huge difference. And, and there are two state of minds because Mobius, you, you, you mentioned mm-hmm. him uh, uh, soon, uh, previously, and he, he was just saying, um, he usually said, sorry, um, that depends you get to don't have any emotion. And you, could, you get to be in a very, um, uh, how to say it, uh, to, to be very calm and, and relax and don't. And sometimes I, I do, I just need exactly the opposite. Uh, so mm-hmm. I put, uh, you know, very, uh, rage against the machine, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just to, to, to push me to, okay, to stay focused because if I'm too calm and I'm just, uh, doing nothing. And when I get back to my picture later on, I, I will, it's not, it's not always better later on than, than the, the rough sketch. So, mm-hmm. to, yeah. Yeah, well, that's cool. I, I have this thing that I call stress focus, which is sometimes I, uh, I try and, you know, do exactly that. I, I basically give myself deadlines where I purposely want to just stress myself out and get things done as quick as I can. But, um, you know, it's rather than kind of being like, okay, I'm going to put on the happy tunes and get this done. It's more about even though you might be in a rush, you still make yourself feel that pressure to um, to be in a rush. Um, but I, w- I was thinking about this the other day and um, I wrote down, it's on my phone somewhere, but I wrote down more of kind of like a, a mental state that would be really great to be in, which is that I remember the days that I'm on the the very end of a project, like the, the, the very last day and maybe you've got to finish at 12 o'clock in the middle of the afternoon to take a flight to, you know, another project in another city. And usually you're so stressed, but you're working on five different things and you're trying to wrap the entire project, finish it all so you can get on that plane to fly out because you're finishing that day. And it's amazing how much work you get done when you're kind of in that mode of like, this has to be done by this time. So somehow you get it done within that time frame. And uh, so I kind of just wrote down this more of a, a silly mindset, but like, treating that like every day where it's like, you know, you have to be done by this time because, you know, you have to to leave the project or whatever. It means that you're really going to minimize your mistakes and kind of do whatever it takes to get the job done and out the door. Yeah, I actually get that. Uh, I, in fact, I've been doing that for some years uh, and I'm a little bit, uh, but it's not um, for, for cover art, maybe a, a, a problem also because, um, how to say it, um, for, for years, I've been doing only production. Mm-hmm. Uh, my, my first year was in, well, well, at first, I didn't have any work as a freelancer. Then I had some work and then I, I, I had tons of cover arts to do. 
with uh, only French customers, French publishers, and some some of them are great, but uh, most of them are awful uh, <laughs> in terms of deadlines. I, 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 I learned speed paintings because because I didn't have the choice because the the, the rates were, were very very low. Uh, so when I started, I was so happy to have a cover art to do, and it was paid, and it hasn't changed that much. It was paid uh, for France, mm -hmm. uh, um, 500 euros, uh, a cover art. Wow, a cover art. okay. And it, uh, yeah, right now it's more like uh, 800, it's not that much in France. Mm -hmm. So Wow. So basically, uh, when I started, I put two weeks in a cover art. Mm-hmm. So I was earning something like 1,000 euros for, for a month. And then uh, there was the, the taxes that was on that. And <laughs> so, was so living in Paris is not really an option. To live and it was just uh, not that much. And so I learned to, to be fast because of the, the, the rates and, uh, and because of the deadlines also, because I had, uh, I had to do for, for, for something like three years I've been doing uh, three cover arts uh, a week. So I, I had to, to speed up the process and to, you know, uh, I don't need, I didn't want, I just wanted to, to be fast to, so I was doing, uh, okay, I would say, okay stuff, not good stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, when, when I was, when, when my illustration were compared to, to international stuff, uh, I was just always uh, the, I was not good. So, Two years ago, I decided to, two or three years ago, I decided to stop that kind of uh, approach and to, to focus myself to make better stuff. And I've, lo uh, <laughs> I've lost quite a lot of money uh, doing that, but uh, I got better. So right now I'm almost the same speed as previously, but just um, focusing on quality, uh, just change a lot of, of things and I got the exposure then, I got bigger, bigger project, mm -hmm. more paid, so that I can spend more time on it. So That's good. I mean, yeah. that, that's actually a really good, um, good point to make. I mean, uh, I'll say two things. Um, one being that I was having a conversation last night about this, um, and this is with someone who's like Christina. You've met Christina. So, yeah, yeah we're, we're talking about artwork and she's working on a, like one of many pieces but one that only pays $150 so the thing is that every time she uh, you know sends it for final the client comes back with more changes so it started to frustrate me because I kept I was telling her that you know you you need to from from the minute you're doing it you need to start saying to them like what else do you need to get this final in other words tell me everything you need changed and if I do all those, you will prove it because you need to keep pushing to get it done because for her, it had gone on for over a month and for a $150 thing, I mean, obviously she's doing a dozen other things, but just one of those things that, um, you know, I had to explain is like the longer, the longer you're, you're working on something, you know, suddenly every email that you're sending is lowering your value because suddenly you're putting more time into this thing and it, it means that it's a lot uh, less of your worth and if you have the, the mindset that rather than you doing the work uh let's say that you hired someone else like let's say that you're the owner of a company and you're hiring another artist to to actually do that work um you wouldn't be paying someone for a month to do the 150 dollars project you'd be telling the client to approve it because um otherwise you'd go into debt trying to pay your employee so that kind of um you know it's it's good to start to to think ahead in terms of okay uh, for this to be profitable you know you really need to think about that rather than the the love of the art but think about this needs to to get done i need to approve it and move on otherwise every minute i spend is making my hourly rate go from you know twenty dollars or sixty dollars down to ten three two one dollars you know so yeah. it's all about that but at the same time like as you said you know at some point you got to start to look at well, rather than taking on these jobs that, you know, aren't very exciting and you're doing more the, the quantity or the, rather than the quality, um, if you just focus or even take a break and just uh, decide, okay, I'm just going to do my own stuff and try and focus on doing the type of work that I love and I really want to attract into my career and my life, um, that's, you know, ultimately the, the best way to start to, to showcase what you can do and what potential you really have. 
Because yeah. most of the clients that you're getting, especially at the beginning of your career, usually they're not going to be the, the type of work that you want. And because of that, you're, you're stuck in a cycle of um, that's the work that you're putting out. So that's the work that you attract. But if you're able to kind of step up your game and, and show the really high tier, the really amazing work, then you can start to attract that really amazing work that you really want to do. That's true. Absolutely. But uh, at the same time, uh, let's say it. Uh, but first of all, uh, about the, the rates, uh, well, as, a, as a freelancer only on illustration, those, those uh, for example, I've, I've worked for, you know, on fantasy collectible, collectible uh, card games. Mm-hmm. And those were typically typically paid uh, one hundred and and fifty dollars. Uh, so and we, they were paid six months after the the, the release date. So it was just uh, <laughs> so uh, you yeah you're not really uh, worrying about it to pay the rent because <laughs> oh you're, in fact at uh, when I started very first I was working on RPGs uh, the the paper RPGs you know mm-hmm. the the role playing games. Yeah, and um, and I was paid uh, not I was paid forty dollars uh, uh, white and black illustrations, and I was so I was working twelve twelve hours a day every day, no no vacations uh, <laughs> for, and I was just uh, at, at the end of the month I was paid something like four hundred uh, euros. That that oh, was man. Uh, I've been doing that for years, it, so. Uh, I would, what I would say there's a balance to find between the rate, the money, the, the fame, because uh, so, some projects are very well um, exposed, and uh, for the for the cards that have made uh, fantasy flight games, uh, is a little uh, uh, it's a low magic the gathering, but it's quite well known. Mm-hmm. So it's cool to have that kind of uh, exposure, yeah. and 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 the fun. You have to have projects, so that you have the the, the, the three the three different uh, elements to, co- to consider. But uh, sometimes, if you're you're not you're not getting paid, uh, and it depends on the work they ask you, because sometimes you they ask you to modify an illustration, and it's not better. So if you're working for nothing, mm-hmm. uh, I'm always okay to to modify to correct all illustrations if 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 they get better uh, if. If it if it at the end it's just uh, no uh, if only the customer that doesn't know uh, what he wants yep. then it, it uh, and illustrations got to only um, uh, focus on one ID very strong ID and the more focused you are and the more efficient you are and the more the, the beautiful uh, illustration um, and more the the, the illustration will, will have an impact on people. Because you you will go straight ahead and you will just uh, put everything in that ID, so everything will just uh, make sense. If uh, there's a client that changes his mind and uh, that ID, but <laughs> same time, you know, I, I love blue, but I want it to look gray and and, and red at the same time. Or <laughs> I, sometimes I have the shitty subjects ever. So for example, uh, I had to do um, two people fighting. But they're friends. They are friends, and and they, and they don't want to fight. So I had to respect that. They, they were <laughs> fighting, but they they love their man. They, they, they. So when you you're doing something in the sense of the the, the you know in the theme of the illustration, oh, okay, I'm completely lost in the. No, no, you're fine. Uh, yeah, uh, and the other stuff was uh, sorry. Le voiture et le. Le voiture et le. Exactly. Le so, vivant est jeune. Uh, Les garçons sweat. Yeah, and sometimes it's better <laughs> to do your own personal stuff than to to take uh, if you just if you know that you're not gonna get paid very well and yeah that you won't uh, do the stuff that you want you want really want to want to do, then uh, you just don't take the shitty job. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm not paid and you do your own stuff not paid at all but then you you are doing uh, your portfolio exactly uh, on the on the field that you want to work on uh, i've got tons of people coming to me saying i want to do cover arts and concept arts for video games and in their portfolio they're nothing like that mm-hmm. just yeah. not a single piece you can't find a concept art uh, job if you don't have concept art in your portfolio, and you can't uh, do any uh, cover art uh, if you don't have any co- cover art, 
So studies are great to train yourself, but in a portfolio gap to have samples of what you want to do later on and the subjects that you want to work on. So I would say that the first step to the, the first uh, thing to do to, to, to put uh, your foot in your career, in your job, it's, it, is to know already what you want to do and to, to train yourself in that direction. That's, because if yeah. you get in that direction, then the people will notice you and will hire you. Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. No, that's really good advice. I mean, you know, you want to essentially put together examples of the work that you want to attract. Um, you know, if, you, if you're going to put together a bunch of uh, logo work and, you know, wh- whatever uh, type of stuff that you're typically getting right now that you're not happy with, then that's the type of work that people are going to see you able to do and, and typically hire you for. And um, I know so many people, especially in 3D, that um, want to do, let's say, creature modeling, but all the, the stuff that they have is more let's say cartoon, more student work. And so when they go to a game company or to a a film company and say, hey, I want to work for you guys, it's like, well, show us that you can work here. Like uh, we can't see anything that says that we can sit you down in the chair right now and you can produce work. So, um, you know, you definitely don't need to do that. And it's difficult too. like what you said about um, sometimes you got to kind of bite the bullet and say, okay, I'm going to take time off of my job or work in my spare time on my own pieces because um, the type of work, like let's say you start taking on all these small crappy jobs, you know, which it's good for money and you, you know, you need money to get by. But like if you're just a- attracting the small jobs that are more distracting and they're taking up all your time, then you'll never get to do, you know, you never have time to, uh, to work on the bigger pieces. So um, I see that a lot with um, even, even some companies I've seen that do print stuff and they want to do really high quality stuff. But what they end up doing is they keep bringing in jobs that are $50 here and $75 here and yeah. they treat them at the same priority as the $1,000 or $2,000 jobs. So suddenly they've got like a couple of expensive high quality jobs, but then they have several jobs that are worth together probably $500 and they're taking up way more time and way more hassle than the rest of them. So being able to eliminate, like turn away the jobs that are just going to take you away from your goal and know which ones they are, I think is really yeah. important. And sometimes, for example, for the role-playing games situations, they were really in the same, uh, let's say, trend, fashion, uh, style that I want to do mm-hmm. later on for cover arts. So they were really uh, low-paid, but uh, I've put as much effort as I could because I don't, don't I did not have high-quality jobs uh, at the same time. So I put all my effort in that in those and to to have a good result. And uh, so. In fact, I've taken a long road, you know, uh, to but yeah, you get to train yourself and do your best on the situations that are really in your in your in your what, what you want to do later. So yeah, I, I worked a lot on those ones, so they were okay, not not good, but back in the days they were okay, which was a big deal to me. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, I, and so in my portfolio had uh, had those, and they were in the good uh, direction. That's mm-hmm. so, sometimes you yeah, you get to. To, to, ba- to, to balance things, to just to try to see how, how much effort you have to, to put. But anyway, you, uh, I, I, I really believe in that uh, rule of uh, 10,000 hours, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm pretty sure it's more like uh, uh, 100,000 uh, hours than uh, 10, but... Uh, <laughs> yeah, I've, I've actually, I was reading that this morning because, um, yeah, everyone always says 10,000 and... Uh, I forget where, but I was reading it this morning uh, that someone was referring to it as 90,000 hours. I'm like, yeah, that sounds a little bit more accurate, I think. So, um, but you're right. Like, uh, one last thing I'll say about this, but like you, you know, when you, whenever I take on a project, I always think about what outcome I want from it. And some jobs are going to be the money. Uh, some jobs are going to be more a passion piece. And, you know, the ultimate goal is, you know, not to get ripped off or anything else, but it doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, I, for instance, I'm working on a, a very demanding project right now that the the budget is very small just because it's with a bunch of people that I really enjoy working with and it's a fun project. So, yeah. you know, it isn't always, you know, you, you think about like what your outcome is and what you want to get from it. And sometimes it's going to be money. Sometimes it'll be experience. Other times it might be for your portfolio or, you know, you got to work on the, the long tail, like your ultimate end game that you want to get from it. So doing fantasy stuff um, helps, you know, even if you're being paid 
a little bit. It means that you're getting to be paid, you know, for something that you're enjoying doing and that will lead to other stuff. And other times it might be to build up credibility or to build contacts. You know, um, the currency that you're working for doesn't necessarily need to be money. There's other valuable ways that you're paying yourself through doing these types of jobs. That's true. That's why we are, we're doing that, those jobs. In fact, it's mm-hmm. not from, uh, yeah, yeah, especially in <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, actually, I, I will just ask, like, um, what's your opinion on the the starving artist? Uh, you know, do you, do you think that's true in a lot of ways? Or do you think that there's ways to, you know, any advice you can give to people in terms of how to, um, you know, treat this like a business and be successful both creatively and career-wise, but also financially as well? Uh, I, I wish I could. I, I really <laughs> wish I could uh, advise people. No, it's uh, it's uh, the, that starving artist is, uh, is really uh, something that uh, that exists. We are many people. Uh, there, there's tons of, of job, but uh, the fact is that oh, everyone wants the, the really same 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 position. Everyone wants to do concept art. Uh, as it's the same thing in three D. Everyone wants to do creative modeling, for example. Mm-hmm. You won't find any uh, people to to do the lighting, for example, uh, pretty rare. You know those kind of. Uh, and uh, in in two D illustration, I'm pretty sure you will have more. There's more work to be done in in web design than in uh, illustration, for example. Yeah. And there are just if, if you're really good, you will always have job anyway. Because uh, so I don't I don't have really. I would just say to people, just focus on what you really want to do. If you if you do that, if you commit yourself to train yourself to have the levels that you because if you if you're passionate on one on one field and you you will know uh, who are the best that you we will try to have uh, a level uh, that's equivalent to mm-hmm. to the best uh, at least to have uh, something near that level because uh, I think I'm good as many of my uh, pre- uh, favorite artists, but. Uh, you know what I'm, mm-hmm. I'm going to say. And you, you were also talking about the people showing the portfolio. But I have many, I'm doing illustration and all the students that came to me just show me speed paintings. Right, okay. And uh, if uh, and sometimes I'll also see people showing me uh, speed modeling or stuff. <laughs> uh, okay, I'm, I'm doing mainly architectural stuff, but... Um, uh, yeah, I, I've put one arrow in that in the the head of the creature. So yeah. basically, you can judge something in one hour or two hours because it's only the long term uh, job that yeah. that pays. And uh, as for being successful as an illustrator or something in the do they feel no, no, I <laughs> I'm trying to to think of something, but. Uh, yeah. Uh, no, you you get to get known, and that's very hard. It's a it's a job in itself. You get to 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 reach people. You get mm-hmm. to meet people. So you get to go to conventions. That's the best way to 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 meet a real art directors that will give you solid advices. Mm-hmm. They will judge your portfolio, and if you're honest with your job and you're you're listening to the art directors, then you will know. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's good. I mean, you're right. Like. Um Illustration, especially concept art, stuff like that, you, you've got to always consider the fact that typically there's going to be one or two people on a project doing that. Whereas um, you look at modeling or animation or even texturing, um, you know, there's going to be a lot more people because there's a lot more things being done. But there's usually only going to be one art director, one, you know, concept guy. There's those are very specific, very key roles that, um, you know, if, if you pick that, then you've got to understand that you know, the competition is going to be very steep because there isn't, uh, you know, an army of people working on a project. It's going to be one person. So um, suddenly you need to make your, make sure that you're really going to stand out if you're going to target those kind of jobs. Yeah. 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 That's cool. It's, yeah. It, it, that's the fun thing is that uh, it's not real competition because uh, I, I've met lots of my colleagues and artists. Mm-hmm. It's not something we don't want to be, Better than this guy or better than this guy, we, because uh, ultimately every everyone if they they spend the time to those uh, ten thousand years, uh, ten thousand yeah. years. Yeah, oh it's, man, it's gone so up even it's, further. It's, you get, uh, this <laughs> and, uh, yeah, you you ultimately have your own style. You find your your style at the very end of the way. In fact, yeah. I think so. 
Oh, and I wanted to ask you the question about visual effects. Do mm -hmm. you have your own style of visual effects? Can you, uh, you know, uh, recognize the effects of uh, one of your colleagues, or, or, um, or do, you, do you recognize your own your, to, your own explosions? To, uh, to a degree. I mean, I, I will say probably more from supervising. Um, you, you know, I, I definitely know um, what creative choices I make and what others make. So, for instance. Um, you know, you might wor work with someone who they, they want everything to be, you know, very overlit or very desaturated. Um, you know, I, I notice, um, I, that, that's another thing too. And I'm sure you're used to this when you're working with directors, you end up having to learn to adopt their style. So you might have your style, but you need to fit within what they want. So, um, that's always the challenge where, you know, I might be instructing someone that, you know, I want to get this, but then I think, well, I want this, but I know that he or she actually wants this. So I've got to kind of contradict myself and go for something that I usually wouldn't make the call for. Um, but, you know, if you're talking about more being on the box and doing 3D, um, yeah, I, I will say that, like, I definitely I definitely can recognize some bad habits that people have. And, you know, I, I know that there's certain things that I do have just kind of trained myself to, to do over time that... Um, that at least I favor and think work really well. And, you know, so, yeah, I definitely think that everyone has their signature ways of working. And, um, yeah, I mean, you know, after a while, it's probably more being a creature of habit. You kind of fall into the same way of doing stuff. And, um, you know, it's, it's only until people point out that you're doing it, that usually you kind of pick up on it. Yeah. Yeah. So, cause I actually was going to ask you that about your work, whether there are certain things that you have in, in your work that you find kind of, have become kind of iconic of how you typically do things. Yeah, well, uh, uh, to, just to avoid that that kind of, um, it, it, you can you, it, I don't think it's a problem at all in VFX or to have you know a, a kind of recognizable touch. But for illustration, it can be it can be a problem. Uh, I'm not a, I'm not a gallery artist, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so. And, and I don't want people to say it's, oh, it's a maximity cover. I want to, 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 for people to look at the cover and say, ah, I've read that book. Uh, I'm really more, much more interested in that. And yeah. people that, uh, that haven't read the book, I want people oh, that like the illustration, they, they will like the book. That's what interests me. So to just to, to, to grab the correct audience. So, uh, to do that, I have to, in fact, my style, uh, just comes from that, uh, I want to be a little bit transparent from a long distance. And, uh, so I've, I've trained myself in different processes, uh, through each new illustration. Mm -hmm. Uh, for example, I was using only, only that brush for an illustration and one layer. And then, uh, for another illustration, I was using, uh, the lasso tool in Photoshop and doing 100 layer, then a custom shape, then, uh, for, for some for some illustration, I'm, I'm doing photo bashing for for very rare illustrations because the subject uh, calls me there. And uh, so, what is a photo bashing? Oh yeah, photo bashing. It's just uh, like kit bashing in 3D. You just take many 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 photos. You can see a lot out of that in, in concept arts in these days. Mm -hmm. uh, you take photos. You just uh, basically you just. Uh, bash them in Photoshop. Okay. Put Sounds them like fun. on the canvas directly and then you do a paint over and you put uh, more photos and you paint over and, and, and the, the, the good photo, bash, uh, the good artists that, that do that, you just, will just say, wow, it looks like a photo, but it's uh, nicely done. And the bad, the, the bad ones, you, you will just say, oh, it's a painting. It's just, oh, I can see a photo <laughs> there, photo there, photo there. Yeah. So. Yeah, I, I'm, tra I'm training myself in all different techniques. Uh, I try to do that and speed painting is a good way to train yourself in other, uh, other, other paintings. And sometimes I do a very crappy brush in Photoshop. We, we, we just look awful. I have to, to, to make, uh, four brush strokes to, to have something cool. And when I'm doing one illustration with only that brush, it takes me something like, Three, three times more times, but it looks very more, cool. uh, yeah, more cool at the end because uh, you can see, I, I can, sometimes you can feel, feel the work in the, yeah, the works fits from you. Mm -hmm. 
No, I hear. That's cool. I like that. That's pretty cool. And like, in terms of uh, painting, like, what do you prefer more, environments or characters? Like, um, what do you uh, find more passionate about? I love them all. Really, I love them all. Uh, and one of, one of my favorite artists and painter is Jeremy Mann. I don't know if you know him. No. He's from San Francisco, and he is an oil painter, and he's doing both uh, town landscapes and uh, beautiful models uh, painting. Wait, what's That's, his name? Uh, his name is Jeremy Mann, uh, M A W N, like a man with two N. Okay, yeah, I think I do know who he is actually, but yeah, okay, cool. Uh, yeah, I love everything. I, I, I like variety. That's why I'm. Uh, I like uh, the different thing uh, stuff. Uh, sometimes I get bored uh, to to do the same thing every time. Uh, one, one day, uh, one once in my career, I had to do. One, uh, five different novel, uh, five different author about uh, you know Arthur and the Holy Grail and Lancelot and all that. So five different novels, and uh, it was just a pain to to do uh, yeah something different always on the yeah. That's what I like a uh, song of Ice and Fire, for example, because there are different universe in it. It's very interesting to to do it. So, yeah. What was uh, your experience like? Like when uh, when how did how did it come to be, and uh, what was it like to you know work on the entire project? Oh, uh, in fact, I, I worked on several yeah. tiny projects before working on on bigger ones. But it's uh, there's a huge difference when we were talking about the ba- the balance, and then it's typically more about the the fun and and the fame than the other thing. Because uh, when I started uh, to work on a uh, song of ice and fire, it was my very first gigs. And it was uh, for uh, collectible card games, in fact. So mm-hmm. for Fantasy Flight games, I was working. Uh, I was a big fan of the books. It was something like uh, ten years ago, and so there wasn't any TV show or anything. I was just a big fan of the books, and they were just doing that collectible card games uh, thing. So I just wrote them, and they paid me uh, one hundred dollars to to do an illustration. And I was so happy because I had to do. The, the the throne of the stacks back in the days, <laughs> so I was happy because of the subject, and it's and I've done tons of stuff for for them. So later on, when I had a uh, regular novel uh, cover arts to do, my clients know my stuff on Games of Thrones on Song of Ice and Fire mm-hmm. uh, because they, they they saw the, the illustration in that card. So they gave me uh, in fact the the cover arts for a Song of Ice and Fire because of that. That's cool. That's really cool. Yeah. And then uh, there's a strong fan base uh, on, uh, about the Song of Ice and Fire, so they just publish it all over the internet, and George uh, just saw them. He, he liked them, so he just hired me to do, uh, back in the days, it was the 2012 calendar, official Song of Ice and Fire, and then he... But I would say it. For, for my, my Iron Throne, which is my most well-known illustration, mm-hmm. uh, as if you consider it like a project, it's a really, really small project. In fact, I've spent tons of hours to do it, but it's just uh, an interior illustration for a book. Wow. Uh, so it's not... Uh, uh, well, it, it, it was not a big, big paying job at all. It was just more. I want to to. I wanted George to be happy with it, um, and fans to eventually fans of the books to say, oh, "Okay, it's more like that. I'm interested in that." So it, it's yeah, it's a big thing in in fame, but uh, it's nothing. In, for example, uh, it's not it's not worth cover art in, in terms of rate. For example, right? Yeah, but um, do you do you find like you got a lot of recognition from doing you know again like just with anything you. You work on high-profile pieces. Obviously, they help build your brand and, you know, help get more work. So, um, you know, did you get a lot of recognition from working on Game of Thrones or Song of Ice and Fire? Uh, Yeah, a little bit, but it's just like... uh, uh, I got got tons of reconnection that I didn't... uh, uh, Before that, I had something like 300 uh, friends on Facebook. (laughs) <laughs> For example, to, to know my fame, which is uh, really virtual. You and had now, 5,000 uh, teenagers. Uh, actually, I remember now. Uh, you, my, my family and stuff like that. <laughs> I, I, th- I, think we're, I think we became Facebook buddies. And um, yeah. uh, you, you're like, hey, add me to Facebook. I'm like, okay. And then uh, a few minutes later, I'm like, 
dude, I can't add you. You've got too many friends. And uh, you're like, oh, no problem. I'll delete somebody. <laughs> and yeah. Uh, yeah, and it's funny because, yeah, I'm now the same way. I'm like, ah, like, you know, <laughs> it's like Facebook, you know, you're going to have to delete people just to, um, to add I'm other honest. people. It's, it's silly. <laughs> yeah, but in the same times, you just don't have uh, uh, you don't have the, the 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 news of anyone in Facebook. All your friends, you never say, you never see the, those uh, there. Yeah, yeah. So you get to to block all the, the people that you add. So it's not of interest. And most of the time, you just suppress people. You don't uh, make a oh, I'm gonna suppress people because mm -hmm. I'm, I've got too many friends. And you don't say that on Facebook. You just remove people, and they don't see the difference at all. Yep. No, it, it's it's funny. Uh, forget artwork. Let's talk Facebook. Um, but no, no, like um, you're you're absolutely right. Like uh, I had this problem maybe a year or two ago where I decided like I, I got frustrated because everyone has Facebook and they get to enjoy it. And um, you know, I've never really gotten to use Facebook for anything because I load up Facebook and it's got all these people that I don't know. And I, you know, it's great. I'm I'm so grateful that I've got people I can connect with and everything, but it just means that I've never had a Facebook wall feed where it's like, oh, I didn't realize my auntie is doing this this weekend or, or whatever. Instead, it's, you know, people posting work and everything else. And um, I remember this is years ago, but I was dating someone very, very jealous. And um, I, I decided I would set up a new Facebook account, one that would be just for friends. And yeah. um, she freaked out that I was trying to do something sneaky or, you know, creating a new Facebook account. So, like, you know, whatever she was thinking. So, um, so suddenly I'm like, okay, well, I can't have a Facebook account for my friends because apparently, you know, that means I could be using it for evil things. So, it's just one of these, like, silly things. So, suddenly I'm like, okay, I'll go back to normal Facebook where it's, it's basically a work tool. You know what I mean? So, you get yeah. to talk to people, but you don't really get to connect and uh, you know, talk to your friends as much as you might. So. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, I got many friends that that have the the the, the, the work page and the, the mm -hmm. personal page. No, it's not. Yeah, wow. But it's I, better I, the girlfriend mainly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Tons yeah. of only with your mobile phone or all the stuff. So that's right. But I, I will say, like, um, I'm grateful to kind of be able to have such a big network on Facebook and other places because you know you go to a new city and. Um, you're like, like, for instance, uh, when I came to Paris, we got stuck in uh, Mexico City, yeah. <laughs> as you know. And um, so I, I, I remember checking into the hotel and I mentioned on Facebook, I'm stuck in Juarez for 24 hours. And I wake up in the morning and there's all these different studios who are like, hey, we'd love to take you out and show you around Mexico City. Let's take you to lunch. We'll show you what we're doing. So I ended up by like, getting to have this great day where I went out and got to see the city and do all this cool stuff and meet all these cool people. And, you know, that that is such like, an amazing tool to be able to, to do that or to be able to jump on and say, should I buy the iPhone or the Droid? And then 1,000 messages pop up saying, get this. And you're like, thank you. Now I know what I want to buy, you know. So, uh, yeah. yeah. Well, that's cool. Yeah, but... <laughs> um, but that's really cool, man. And, like, I, I guess – um you know, while we're on the subject of, of Game of Thrones, I mean, well, I should say A Song of Ice and Fire, but um, I don't know. Like, so for you, what was uh, what was your experience like overall? Like, where, what was your favorite piece? Obviously, there's pieces like the Iron Throne that are the most uh, notable, perhaps, or the popular. But um, for you, what were some of the pieces that you were really passionate about? Because I'm sure everyone's going to check out your work who hasn't already seen your work as soon as they finish this podcast. So uh, is there any pieces that for you you really uh, loved? I prefer, uh, right now, uh, there's still flows in it, but I prefer the, um, uh, the dancing, dancing dra death, sorry, Dance with Dragons, and uh, I've made it recently, so in my opinion, it's a little bit better. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, um, I've made the, the, the throne room in Mirin, in the pyramid, uh, with uh, Daenerys in it, so I just try to, to settle, uh, like a concept art, uh, a background uh, with a huge, huge uh, throne room. I, I like the, the very impressive rooms. Mm -hmm. And I also like my piece. It was the very first for the calendar uh, with uh, Bran Stark jumping from roof to roof. Cool. Yeah, I was flicking through that book, uh, Coverama, that um, you gave me uh, right before uh, I think I left to fly back to L.A., and um yeah like there's so many amazing pieces in there that you know you you recognize obviously 
from the TV uh, as well, which just shows how kind of accurate it's it's been referenced um, probably from your work. So, I mean, it's it's amazing. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> That's great, man. Yeah. I, yeah, I, 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 I think been, they have been referencing from my work or not because, you know, the, the books are very, uh, very, what's it? Um, detailed and mm -hmm. precise. So, but that's funny because there one piece where, where uh, that I started for George that was uh, a swamp piece and with uh, two two ring towers in the the, the middle of it. And uh, so I, I've drawn the first version of it, and George told me it's not that at all. So he made me add trees and forest, and it's just and uh, in the show they just ended with uh, the first version that I had. So because. Yeah. Uh, when you sometime when you when I was reading the the, the book, I was I had that uh, you know that um, in the lot lot of the rings there's there are swamps too with uh, you know uh, what is called uh, Frodo and and mm -hmm. Sam Gollum just just they are just uh, riding sorry they're walking through through that those swamps with yep. dead elves and yep. uh, I had that picture in mind when I, when I read the book and the guy from the TV show, they, they had the same picture because they, they've done that in the, the show. It was fun. And it was not the good vision. So sometimes it's... <laughs> <laughs> it's funny because when you said Lord of the Rings, I, I instantly thought of that scene actually. But um, that's cool. And yeah, I remember like kind of how you came on to, to do those books. Like um, I remember when Peter Jackson went to do Lord of the Rings, like... Uh, I forget the other artist, but he went to Alan Lee and the John other guy. Hove. What's yeah, his John, name? John Hove. John Hove, yeah. So, yeah. Um, and because like they they had gone and created so much amazing art related to Lord of you know Lord of the Rings. So like because of because of that, why not go to someone who's passionate about it, who knows so much about it, and has already kind of created their own vision about it, and um, have them kind of help you know recreate the the vision on screen. So. You know, if you have someone who's kind of proven themselves um, already with the same material, then um, you know they're a shoe in. Like I've, I know people who um, who wanted to work a Blizzard, and they went and they created some really amazing artwork of orcs and stuff like that for Warcraft. And naturally, Blizzard's like, well, you're creating exactly our end product, so we'd be stupid not to to bring you on. Oh yeah, well, you know, it's, a, it's something a little bit tricky when you're a freelancer you can't uh, you're not usually hired because uh, people want something as someone in-house uh, mm -hmm. a salary job to just own the copyrights yeah uh, if you're just um, if you hire a freelancer to do to do stuff then the copyrights uh, the, 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 the the society hide as the copyrights but not the the author copyrights mm -hmm. so if they want to, so it's normal that they, they didn't hire me or they, they they would had have to hire me in house, uh, so to own you. <laughs> yeah, to to own my art. In fact, mm -hmm. yeah, that's and and yeah, your soul. Uh, maybe, maybe my soul. I, <laughs> sorry, it would have been in, in Germany probably. Oh yeah, uh, you know it's, it's Pixmon Pixmon who did the, the okay. you, stuff uh, gives us from the TV show. Oh right, yeah, yeah, um, uh, yeah. I actually was hanging out with them at the. Emmys like two years ago. Um, I can't remember anyone's names right now, but yeah, they're they've got an amazing team. Actually, um, Dan Catcher, who is the guy who designed all the dragons, I want to get him on the podcast in time because oh, yeah. um, he the he, show now. Yeah, he's uh, he's been creating the dragons from the very beginning. So um, yeah, like an amazingly talented artist. And like I remember, um, I think it's the last Game of Thrones. Like they decided, you know what, like. Let's not worry about Pixamondo. Let's just go directly to you because um, you know you you're literally the father of, of dragons. So you know, <laughs> and uh, even Jurassic Park, like though you know when they first greenlit that two years ago, is just Jurassic World. It's like, well, you've been doing all these amazing dragons. Like, you know, how about you come and consult doing some dinosaurs as well? So again, you you create the the end product of what you want to do, and you are then going to attract those clients who. Uh, that you want to do. So if you love dragons and that's what you want to do, then uh, you can do that for forever. So yeah. painter or Photoshop? Oh, Photoshop. Yeah. I, I also use painter sometimes, but mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, it's uh, to, to change my, uh, my habits. Sometimes I use, uh, I use painter, but um, not that much these days. 
Yeah, I um, I started out in Painter Painter Two back when Fractal Design owned it, and um, that was back in '95. And yeah. um, so I had used Photoshop a little bit, you know, and um, but yeah, Painter I loved back then because you had all the nozzles and like really amazing brushes. You could yeah. use anything from pastels to you know acrylic or anything. So um, yeah, I loved it. But um, Photoshop just seemed to be way more practical and um, way more easy to control. That's funny because uh, when you you go deep into the the, bo the, the two softwares, I, I find myself to, to find the, the the Photoshop render. Of, uh, in Photoshop, you get to do your own brushes because the the, the basic brushes are not very useful for me. Mm -hmm. And uh, in Painter, you get to spend hours to find the good brushes <laughs> yeah. because they are, they, are, they are all already made, but you get to find them. Yeah, yeah. And uh, that's the difference. But ultimately, uh, I found that uh, it was more easy to do sci-fi in Painter because you get so many technical stuff in that. Mm. For example, you the nozzle of the you, you can't you, you can uh, just uh, you can add glow. You can add like anything really to it. You can use, uh, for example, abstract shapes and mm -hmm. load them as nozzle to make uh, very very strange shapes that you couldn't make in Photoshop. Mm. And you can also miss color because in the nozzle you can have uh, already the colors in, the, in your own nozzle and you can adjust the color that you want. It's just a very technical uh, painter, much more than Photoshop, in fact. Because uh, in Photoshop you don't have that many, you have oh, a lot of uh, different settings that you can adjust, but you don't have as many, as much as, uh, as settings as in painter. So, yeah. In fact, I find Photoshop more simple than painter. So, yeah. Um at least when I started to really kind of learn both, I found Photoshop to be a lot more straightforward. Plus, at least back then, I found to be the hotkeys and everything to make more sense. So, uh, yeah, yeah, you know, because I, I remember I started out in, um, probably don't know, but like Deluxe Paint, um, which yeah. was, yeah. Seems, only, uh, yeah, we, we talk about it. Yeah. Oh, right. We don't right, remember right. it. And no, no. We about it, but <laughs> yeah, we talked about it. Yeah, there. but yeah. yeah, I mean, for me, like I kind of loved that and I eventually moved to, uh, Painter and you know those other crappy tools like uh, Animator Pro and um, even Paint Shop Pro was like a, a shareware free tool which was pretty amazing back in the day. But yeah. Um, but yeah, it just seems like these days it's funny, but the main tools that still stand strong are both Painter and Photoshop. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. it's that same uh, yeah same philosophy because Dell Expense it was uh, back mm. in the days it was the thing. It was Dell Expense and mm. yeah. And uh, so we'll start to wrap things up, but like, um, you know, obviously I'll put in the show notes links to your one bazillion links to your website and DeviantArt, uh, to your books, YouTube. Uh, is there any other places that people can follow you or check out your work that you can recommend? Uh, yeah, you know, on it's art, on, uh, there are, um, uh, a live stream channel on it's art. That, okay. Like, uh, so... Uh, each time I can, I, I am doing free live streams to show the process, mm -hmm. and uh, they are still on uh, the It's Art website. So you can just uh, I've made something like eight color uh, for for real work works. Mm -hmm. So it's not uh, it's not a paying tutorial. It's just I'm just sharing my process and uh, letting the the webcam on when I, while I'm painting. So, so cool. I, I will send you the link. Yeah, please do. And uh, yeah, I just spoke to Patrice uh, literally a few minutes before I spoke oh. to you. Um, he's on vacation right now, I think. But uh, yeah, you know, all, always frantically trying to get things all going for Paris next year. So uh, I, I guess if anyone wants to come along and uh, hang out with you and me and get some drinks at the Hard Rock, <laughs> maybe, some, <laughs> maybe somewhere better. Um, yeah, yeah, then uh, we'll be around in, in March. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, it's, it would be just awesome. Cool. Yeah, I can't wait for it. Yeah, it's gonna be fun. And uh, yeah, I appreciate you posting all those uh, pictures of, of alcohol on Facebook, saying, "Why aren't you with me?" <laughs> um, no, uh, I've not done that. <laughs> so ah, yeah, so, so sorry. Yeah, I've been, in fact, uh, I've tried to do that many times, but I didn't have battery at all. So, so I wanted to yeah to take as many beer <laughs> photos for you in Nancy as possible, just to. To invite you, you know. we we sent one back to you. Uh, I was with Andrew Schmidt from Pixar. Uh, well, he's at DreamWorks now, uh, directing, and um, yeah, we're, we're all at a dinner at Bestia in downtown LA. So we're trying yeah. to send a few back, saying we we can uh, 
we can lobby the the ball back to you. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so just quickly, um, I know that a lot of people want to follow in your footsteps. So, do you have any advice for those that um, may want to get more exposure or help kind of build their brand or even just get better at their craft? Like, is there any resources or key bits of advice that will instantly make people 1,000 times better and have amazing skills and be able to fly? Oh, yeah. So, <laughs> to our races, yeah. <laughs> first of all, uh, get to stay focused on really what you want to mm-hmm. do. Then uh, don't take too many tutorials on Facebook or Gumroad or all that stuff because mm-hmm. uh, each time you're looking at the tutorial, you're not training yourself. So yeah. sometimes they are very good, but to have uh, some because right now it does the you know the gum gum root stuff yep. you can buy a video tutorial for five dollars and and people just look at the videos uh, videos videos and they they just don't train themselves uh, yeah so you get very solid knowledge on that but if you don't train yourself then uh, it would be wasteful Andrew um, oh, sorry I was just gonna say like Andrew Kramer and I um, Andrew from Video Copal we were talking about that a little bit. A while back about um because you know it's great that people are putting out content and it, i love the fact that people share knowledge so freely now but at the same time you know it does mean that there is so much out there it's kind of hard to know you know whether you should be investing so much time into something without knowing you know what you're going to get back from it so um you know i, I guess it's more a matter of um if you are going to do training be careful what you invest in and that way you know because you, as you said like you can easily watch someone do a bun- bunch of stuff but you know you could easily be out there challenging yourself doing as you were talking about speed painting or a dozen other things trying to find ways to yeah. hone your skills yeah and as an advice to get better really quickly first of all you get to want to get better because sometimes you're just uh happy with your pieces mm-hmm. and it's the uh, i'm still not happy with any of my pieces that's the main thing and i, I want to keep that yeah. so uh, you get to train yourself in doing really quick speed paintings, uh, no more than 30 minutes of speed, speed paintings, and then you do very ambitious paintings. Mm-hmm. And when I say ambitious, I will say, uh, for example, an army attacking a fortress, uh, attacked by dragons, and view from uh, <laughs> above and under uh, anything. So uh, uh, try always to, to do only things that you don't know to do at all. And uh, for, for example, one of my first pieces where uh, I didn't know what to do cathedral, so I just chose to train myself in perspective at the same time. So I used uh, uh, how to say it? It was a, 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 fa- a false perspective, a wrong one, a mm-hmm. far to stretch. Uh, be, uh, and at the same time, that I, I, I've made a cathedral from view from above. You know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And when you do only stuff that you just don't know. Uh, the, the easy stuff will go will, will, will become even easier. So be ambitious and try to to always uh, uh to say it, uh, to go directly to the best stuff that you can do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, the only thing, yeah, and uh, just once a job is made, uh, just don't uh, be happy with it and just go for the next one. But yeah. you yet finish your pieces. <laughs> you get to 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 go to the next one and be humble uh, every day because uh, that's the way you get better. That's great, man. Uh, we talked about it last episode actually about failing up. In other words, you set your goals really extreme and out of your comfort zone, so that way you probably won't get there, but you'll do exceptionally better than you would if you decided to tackle something easy. You know, if you decide yeah. to do something really really hard. You'll, you might only get 80% there, but that 80% is a lot better than 100% of something that was much easier, you know, to do and, and not as impressive. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. That's great, yeah. man. I'll, I'll just share uh, one bit of advice. I don't know advice, but um, uh, something so contradicting that I, I found I do, which is that I'm never happy with the work that I put out. And so usually this is more when I, was, when I did a lot of 3D, but I would be working on something and I'd hate it and I'd show it to the director or I'd show it to other people. And usually, you know, a lot of the time they'd say like, wow, that was, that's really cool. And I would think like, wow, I really hate this, but they think it's cool. So then I would start doing work and then I think it's really cool and they hate it. So, uh, you know, suddenly it's this big contradicting thing where, um, suddenly if I, if I do something and I hate it, I think, well, maybe if I hate it, everyone else will like it. 
and you know so I, suddenly the 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 bar is put down so low because it's a pile of shit and i feel like it's a pile of shit so i show it to everyone and it actually is a pile of shit so <laughs> you know suddenly it's this big contradicting thing where i'm like well if i think it's a crap then maybe it's good and so it leads into this full sense of uh of appreciating your work thinking that you know what, what is bad is good and vice versa when it's like no there actually can be times when your work actually is just a pile of shit and you know you've got to kind of step it up but that's me rambling at one in the morning but uh but honestly man, this this has been really great to you know get to catch up and uh shoot the shit a bit so um no i really appreciate it so i <clears throat> appreciate you taking the time to uh to do this. Uh, yeah it's, it was great talking to you yeah cool, man and uh yeah i'll um i'll put links in in the show notes for all this stuff and um also to the it's art stuff as well as uh, the stuff that we did in paris so people can come and check out some of your talks because I, I know the the one you did in composition i only arrived i think i was really hung over um uh, but i arrived for just the end of it but it was, it was really cool to watch oh yeah uh, well in fact uh, I, I spoke so it wasn't that cool but uh <laughs> <laughs> hey, that, that means like if you think it's bad, then it must be good. And <laughs> I don't know. Most of the time, when I think it's bad, people think it's bad too. <laughs> I've got the chance. I'm lucky enough. And when I think it's good, sometimes people think it's good too. But it's not every time man, either. So <laughs> I know it does, it does your head. Yeah. Out. My, my also the other advice is something very practical. It's try to see what's not good in your stuff. And try to see what's good in the other people's stuff because mm -hmm. I see many beginners trying to criticize other people's work. Mm -hmm. And so when you are very, very critic on, on your own stuff and you look only at the good stuff of people's work, then you, you have a very positive state of mind that mm -hmm. gets you. That's good. This um, weather. Actually, probably the, the best kind of big turning point I ever had in, in my work was always when I started to look at it from the perspective of my supervisor when I was really young, um, cause I might be looking at my work and thinking it's fine. But when I would start to kind of like, you know, look at it again and look at it as if I was the supervisor and start to tear it apart, that's when suddenly my, my work quality would shoot up because if I could tear apart my work and be really critical about it from what I'd learned from whoever was supervising me, it would mean that I could really, um, kind of jump up to you know, anticipate what they would say far before they ever saw it. So usually by the time they saw it, anything they would have said, I would have already addressed. And um, I think it's very hard. It's hard not to, it's hard to remember to, to do that. But when you do kind of step out and, and come back and sit down as if you are the supervisor looking over someone else's work and start to just absolutely demolish your work and point out all the problems with it, that's when you can really, you know, kind of uh, carve it out into like a really strong piece. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Yeah. And you, you make it also, uh, you, the, the, then your, super, your, your supervisor earns time. Mm -hmm. he, he get, he, he, well, not for you because you're always, <laughs> I'm pretty sure you already know how good you are, but uh, you know, when you're a beginner or when you do the, the job yourself, then uh, people know that you're reliable and efficient and then you get higher more easily. And yeah, so no, I, I, yeah, I, yeah, I, I definitely would say that like, um, it puts more f uh, faith in you. Like it, they, they have more faith in you. They'll look at your, you know, they'll, they'll basically know that they'll feel like you're doing such a good job. I'm really tongue twisted and tired right now. <laughs> uh, they're, they'll, they'll realize you're doing such a, a confident job uh, by yourself that they don't, micromanage you and that's you know there there are times in my career that i noticed i went from being someone that the producer would check in on several times a day to suddenly being like okay just let us know when it's ready just because you know they suddenly could trust you to kind of be uh self-maintained yeah yeah sure yeah that's the best thing yeah cool man but uh i i appreciate it i will let you get on with your day i know it's getting late over there no it's fine it's really fine okay yes. let's talk let's talk for a few more hours so uh, how's the kids? <laughs> Actually, I, I will just say, uh, we'll, we'll wrap it up there. Oh yeah, same thing there, really. Okay guys, so that is it for this episode. I've got a few really cool ones coming up. And in the meantime, like I said, if you want to enter the contest, just go leave a review in iTunes and I'll leave a link to all that stuff in uh, the show notes. But just leave a hashtag VFX1 in the review and I'll be announcing that at the end of August. 
Now, in addition to that, if you want to meet up with Mark and myself in Paris next year in March, I'll leave information on where to go to register for the event and we can all get some beers and hang out. It'll be a lot of fun. Okay, so for the show notes, just go to alanmckay.com. So it's A-L-L-A-N-M-C-K-A-Y.com slash 45. Okay, so that is it for now. I'll see you next time and thanks again for listening. Welcome to the Alan McKay Podcast. Alan is an Emmy Award-winning visual effects artist and mentor to many leading industry experts. Listen in as Alan talks with other industry leaders in film, video games, and visual effects about their experience, lessons, and methodology. Alan will teach you pivotal advice to fast-track your career, better your skills, and reach your ultimate dream job. Check out the latest episodes on alanmckay.com.